Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the fifth meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for 2019. Can I ask that everyone ensures that mobile devices are switched to silent? Um, and welcome John Finney, MSP, and Gordon Lindhurst, MSP, joining us this morning. Agenda item one is Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill um, engagement. The committee undertook a number of engagement visits, and I'm going to ask members to feedback briefly on the, the visits that they've attended. Mm. Um, Fulton McGregor and Gail Ross were at Dad's Rock um, in January. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, it was a, a really a worthwhile and interesting visit to, to Dad's Rock um, a, a month or so ago. Um, the, just to give a wee bit of background, the purpose of the visit was to speak to a group of parents, carers and grandparents about the proposed Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill and Dad's Rock Academy is a weekly mu music, music tuition for children aged 7 to 16 and for their parents and carers. Uh, I have to say it was a very good discussion, um, very open um, and I think as you would um, probably imagine with a diverse group uh, there, there was, a, there was a, a mix of views but my general feeling uh, on it was a, a kind of couple of points. One, a general support for the principles of this bill, but um, a bit of concern maybe around how it might impact on family life. And I think that the people that spoke to us were maybe just looking for that wee bit of reassurance that uh, folk weren't going to unnecessarily find themselves foul of the law. Um, and when we spoke to them about the, what the principles of the bill were, uh, they seemed to be quite reassured with that. But, but a general support for the principles of not using physical chastisement. Okay. So a good, a good visit. Thank you very much. Um, the Vice Convener and I visited Midlothian Sure Start um, grandparents group um, and had a very nice morning with the grandparents and their children there. I don't, Alec, do you want to feedback something on that? Yes, thank you, Convener. I thoroughly enjoyed our morning with the grandparents in uh, Dalkeith, um, particularly enhanced by the birthday cake that we were served. Um, it was a really interesting discussion, actually. I think it was, it's fair to say um, that uh, all of the grandparents understood um, what was being proposed here, that, that they were well cited on that. Um, largely supportive as well, um, despite um, I, I think misapprehensions I might have had going in. But actually, we were interested to hear of the journey that some grandparents had been on. And I, I think there was a view that um, perhaps they had initially uh, resisted change, but um, over the years, the more they'd seen um, about children's rights and about the international perspective, um, pers been persuaded otherwise. That wasn't universally held. There were a couple of voices still very much opposed to the um, suggestion that we, we change the law in this way. Uh, but I'd like to put on record my thanks to uh, the Shore Star um, staff and indeed the grandparents who uh, entertained us and made us feel so very welcome. Absolutely, thank you. And Mary and Annie were at um, Messy Church in Pollock Shields. Mary, can you... Annie, oh, sorry, Annie, can you feed back on that? Thanks, convener. Yes, myself and Mary Fee were at the Messy Church in Moss Park on Monday night. And again, we, we, we joined the, the group for evening meal and um, birthday cake as well. Um, and it was my birthday the day before, so they sang happy birthday to me. So thank you very much. Um, but no, I mean, it was a really interesting discussion. And it was parents um, and grandparents there and carers. They were probably mixed views on the bill, but probably erring on the side of they didn't support the bill. Um, they thought that there was already common law that um, dealt with assault, and they thought there should be more explanation around assault, and especially the, the wording of and the, the, the top of the bill, they found it wasn't reflective of what they were trying to achieve. Um, and they, they thought, they spoke as well about um, restraint as well of a, of children and how would that affect the if they had to restrain a child or grab a child from running into the road they felt the bill would maybe put um put more pressure on them not to actually physically touch children and um, so that was sort of where we were but again they were very open and and the discussion was flowing and they weren't that supportive of the bill okay thank you very much um the committee is committed to hearing the views of children and on consideration we didn't feel that formal evidence sessions in the parliament were the best way to do that. Um, we worked with a local YMCA group to hear the views of children and young people in a more child-friendly um, 
setting. That visit took place on the 26th of February. Oliver Mundell and I um, attended. Mm -hmm. um, we're also going to be meeting with children and young people on Sky. And the findings from all these visits will be um, reflected in our Stage 1 report. Oliver, do you want to speak to our visit um, to the YMCA? Uh, thank you, uh, convener. It was an excellent visit to the YMCA youth group in Kirkcaldy. Um, but again, uh, we, we heard mixed views uh, on the bill, some very sophisticated views on uh, some very uh, passionate uh, advocates uh, on, on both sides. Um, we uh, saw the uh, young people undertake um, a work through a drama scenario that they'd designed uh, themselves. Uh, in that we saw uh, a young child uh, trying to uh, cross uh, the road. Uh, so it was a similar example to, to what had uh, come up uh, possibly on, on uh, one of the committee's uh, other visits. But the, the young people themselves um, worked through uh, what, what they thought could be done uh, to prevent it. But there was certainly a group of young people uh, with, within that group uh, who felt that it, it was appropriate uh, to uh, to, to use physical uh, force um, in, in, in that particular scenario. Um, but I thought it showed um, how important it is to, to hear from uh, young people, um, and I'm certainly interested um, in, in looking more at that as we go through our consideration. OK, thank you very much. Agenda item two is um, Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill, and it's our oral evidence session. I'd like to, wel I'd like to welcome panel one. <coughs> Excuse me. Professor Jane Callaghan, Director, um, Child Wellbeing and Protection, University of Stirling. Dr Anya Heilman, um, Lead Author, Equally Protected Report. And Diego Quiros, Policy Officer at the Scottish Human Rights Commission. You're all very welcome this morning. Um, I'd like to um, kick things off by asking um, each of you if you support the Bill's aim to help bring an end to the physical punishment of children. Jean. Thank you. Um, yes, I do. I, th I think that it's it's long overdue that we um, end the justification of reasonable chastisement and that the balance of evidence in um, psychological research and in research on domestic abuse and <coughs> other forms of, of, uh, of family violence suggests that, that this is the right choice. Thank you. Anya, push the button. Um, yes, so uh, my co-authors and myself are very much uh, are in support of this proposed legislation. Um, what our report on the evidence around physical punishment um, has shown very clearly is that physical punishment has the potential to cause harm to children, that it um, is not effective as a parenting strategy, so it, has, it tends to increase problem behavior and also socio-emotional difficulties in children, and it also um, carries the risk um, of um, injurious abuse. So um, my co-authors and I very much welcome this bill. We think it's a very important bill, and indeed um, to end the, the uh, physical punishment of children was our number one recommendation that we have made in the report. So we very much support the bill. Thank you. Thank you. I should say you don't have to press okay. the buttons, they come Perfect. on for you. Yeah. Uh, good morning and thank you for the invitation. And the defense of justifi justifiable assault um, yeah, should be removed from Scott's law. Therefore, the, the commission supports the, the bill. Um, both national and international human rights body have repeatedly called for an end of corporal punishment. And uh, uh, two days ago, I was uh, in Geneva talking to the CEDAW committee, and, and, and again, they repeated that that call to, to the United Kingdom and Scotland. So I think it's, it's very important. And um, I think the, the committee is familiar with, with, with all these uh, uh, treaty bodies and, and their call for ending uh, corporal um, punishment of children at home. So I will not expand on that point now. But it, there is an international consensus also in, in, in Europe and, and of, of the unacceptability of corporal punishment on children, which is supportive for, uh, uh, from, from uh, broad evidence of uh, scientific and, and, and medical evidence, which the, the, the panel is, 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 is more uh, um, uh, suited to, to respond to those points. And I will come back to the human rights issues uh, when you feel, feel that I should. Thank okay. you. Thank you. And um, we'll move to questions now from the committee. Alec Hamilton. 
Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. Thanks very much for coming to see us today. Um, we've had a, a great deal of evidence in advance of the Stage 1 consideration of this bill. Um, obviously, that has been mixed, both for and against. Um, those who have offered evidence against have often cited uh, a perceived tension between the rights of children and the rights of parents, or uh, the right to family life, if you were. This committee is well versed in um, the international community's interventions in this country around things like the including observations of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, which consistently suggests that we need to end physical punishment of children. That's well documented in international treaties. But is there a commensurate um, clause within international law um, in terms of the rights of parents to parent their children or the right to family life, which would which you would see as clashing with that right of children not to be physically punished. Put simply, is there a right within any international convention which gives parents the right to physically punish their children? Um, I think it, for us it's quite clear that uh, the measure in, in the bill is not aimed at criminalizing parents or interfering with family life but it's set, setting a clear standard of caregiving and redefining what is acceptable in terms of how we treat our children in Scotland. So the, I, I don't think that we should be concerned, there should not be any concern in safeguarding children's dignity and physical integrity in encouraging positive discipline and education of children through non-violent means. It's the, it's the duty of the, of the governments to and, and public bodies as well to take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social and educational measures to protect the child from all forms of physical and mental violence. And, and this, this has been reinforced, and I, I get into to your point now, this has been reinforced by the, the European Court uh, adjustment and by, any, uh, by several bodies, uh, as, as you mentioned, of, of the UN. So we have a, a, a case, um, the a Swedish case, a German case, and a Dutch case that um, where the European Court of Human Rights has said that the, the right to family life is not interfered by, by uh, protecting the child from uh, corporal punishment because it will be a clearly, um, it will clearly interfere with the child's right to dignity. So there, there are several cases around around this that that support uh, the prohibition and, and 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 support the idea the idea or rebut the idea that um, that that measure will uh, interfere with the uh, family life and and right of the parents to um, discipline the ch the child. So that tension is a false perspective. There is no clause in international treaties which say that parents should have the right to physically punish their children. Absolutely. Do, sorry, just, yes, of course, come in. I just uh, welcome Dr Stuart Wheaton um, this morning. Dr Wheaton, um, as an opening question, we asked other um, panel members if they supported the bill's aim to um, bring an end to the physical punishment of, of children. I wonder if you would wish to. Uh, yes, I think this is a tragic, depressing bill, and yet another one. Um, which appears to represent the aloof, elitist nature of politics uh, and professional life that treats parents in a very patronising and degraded way, uses all sorts of weird legalistic talk about violence, uh, equating children with adults. That makes no sense at all to ordinary people. Uh, and criminalises parents, uh, despite, again, uh, people trying to claim that it doesn't. But people talk about all the evidence proves that any level of smacking to children uh, damages them. is absolutely untrue and the opposite of the truth. Uh, but I presume I'm just wasting my time because this bill has already passed. OK, thank you for that. Alec. So, um, for the benefit of Dr. Wayton, um, before you came in, sir, I asked the rest of the panel 
Um, th well, I, I mentioned the fact that we'd received a great deal of evidence in advance of stage one of this bill, um, all of it mixed. I mean, obviously, there were two sides to both uh, to that evidence. Um, but the, those who offered evidence against the bill suggested that there was a tension between children's rights and parents' rights. And I wanted to unpack that with the panel and ascertain we, we're very well versed in where in international treaties and conventions uh, the right for children not to be physically punished is enshrined. But if I want to know if that tension is real and is there a conflicting right within international treaties which allows parents the right to physically punish their children? <coughs> Dr. Hyman, sorry, Halman, is it? Hyman. Um, would you like to answer that question? Um, my area is, is not international law, but okay. I am not aware of any such um, treaty. But obviously the UK uh, has ratified the United uh, Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is very clear yeah. um, about this issue, and very, um, there is no ambiguity. So they have repeatedly stated that all physical punishment and all its forms should be prohibited by law. Dr. Waiton, would you like to... Well, I don't accept the concepts. I don't accept the people that are defining the concepts. The idea of children's rights is a, a bit of a, a, a nonsense concept. Children don't have rights. They don't have the same framework of rights as uh, adults. They have protections. And essentially, when we talk about children's rights, what we are really talking about is uh, the right of professionals to make decisions on their behalf. Um, so it's a confused concept, uh, goes against the framework of how we have historically thought about rights in terms of uh, freedoms. So it's a problem. And the problem that we have with this bill is essentially a question of autonomy. Uh, you are undermining the autonomy of loving parents to decide how to raise their children uh, with a sense of privacy and also a sense of support from uh, society uh, and in the process you are degrading something which is done as a form of discipline that should not be understood as a form of violence uh, and parents should be uh, supported rather than undermined so for me this is a question of autonomy uh, and uh, I think you have to question the whole framework of how we think about children's rights. Before I bring in Professor Callahan there, can I just ask Dr. Wayson, I mean, that defence of autonomy used to apply to the physical punishment of women by their husbands. Would you suggest that that should be brought back? Uh, no, because I don't look at adults and children as the same, unlike the people who are supporting this bill who seem to look at adults and children the same and therefore degrade uh, or confuse uh, action. So uh, people here who defend the idea that adults and children should be treated the same in terms of violence, I assume see a smacking a child and smacking a woman as the same thing, which I think is degrading to women uh, because they are not the same thing. Adults and children are very different. Uh, we would not expect to ground our partners, refuse to let them leave the house that would be seen as a criminal offence, whereas we <coughs> ground our children, or perhaps in a few years' time, uh, you will be making that criminal as well. Professor Callan. Thank you. Yeah, um, having done hundreds of interviews with children who've experienced domestic abuse, I would have to say that I can't agree that children are a different order of human being from adults, and I can't agree that they don't have personhood that they don't have a capacity to reflect on their experiences and that they aren't harmed by those experiences. In terms of the idea of the loving parent defence, unfortunately there is reasonable international evidence that suggests, so for instance a study by Jing and Wang that suggested that um, actually uh, the loving parent defence doesn't really function particularly well and that children experience the same level of harm as a consequence of domestic, uh, uh, sorry, as a consequence of smacking um, by parents, regardless of whether it's loving or motivated positively or not. Um, unfortunately, I also can't agree that the balance of evidence does anything other than indicate that um, capital punishment has no, sorry, I keep using the wrong words, corporal punishment has no um, 
positive consequences and has plenty of negative consequences in terms of mental health outcomes, in terms of exposure to risk of future uh, physical harm, and in terms of uh, difficulties around issues like attainment. So there's evidence, for instance, that children who have experienced uh, corporal punishment at home um, are actually disengaged, more likely to be disengaged from school and more likely <coughs> to experience um, educational difficulties. Thank you. Um, you mentioned violence and, uh, and the impact of harm. Um, we've also had a lot of evidence, uh, both for and against, around this and recognise that there is a spectrum of physical punishment. Um, Professor, um, forgive me if I pronounce this name wrong, uh, Lazarel um, from America um, is obviously a very outspoken critic of changes to the law such as this and talks about the fact that backup smacking, as he refers to it, can be a, a, a very effective tool of parenting when other parenting techniques fall down. Um, are all parents capable of using, deploying physical punishment in that way um, or is there a point where parents perhaps lose control and that that no longer becomes a, a reasonable sanction or a, a, a useful effective tool? I think again the balance of evidence suggests that um, that there is a strong correlation between parents who, who are willing to use smacking or do use smacking and parents who are likely to lose control um, in in their disciplinary practices so again I would say I, I can't agree with that, that premise, and I don't think it's borne out particularly well by the international evidence base. Dr. Waiten, I see you shaking your head there. Well, it's, it seems fairly clear to me that there's what you call advocacy research, which is people who've already made their minds up, and then there's research where you're actually trying to look at it, and as far as I can tell, Robert Lazellier actually tries to look at it, and he, he talks about there's been nine studies that look at the overview of all the research, seven of which do not come to the conclusion uh, that uh, smacking uh, is harmful for children, particularly, as you say, backup smacking, and actually they come to the conclusion that backup smacking, um, which is something where you, 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 it's not used as a first resort, it's not used as the only resort, actually ends up being the best form of discipline, where it's you, generally speaking you don't smack, but occasionally it's uh, you might, uh, and that, uh, uh, so the, the evidence, uh, the idea that there is proof, there is evidence and all the rest of it, that uh, 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 a light form of smacking damages children, is just not borne out. And I would just plead to your common sense, right? I would plead to your common sense, that if th you think doing that to a small child is a form of violence that harms them, then you are living on another planet. So um, in response to that, I mean, I attended a conference, uh, Dr. Waiton, in 2007 on physical punishment of children. It was addressed by John Carnican, who at that time, um, as a senior police officer, was head of the Strathclyde Violence Reduction Unit. He was there because he saw a, an empirical correlation between the use of physical punishment in the home and violence on the streets, because in his words, um, that any form of violence in the home used as a tool of sanction or in anger, legitimise that as a tool of sanction or in anger between children and their peers as they grew up. Do you recognise that violence begets violence in that nature, in that case? Uh, well, I don't even accept that that done to a, a three, four, five-year-old child should be understood as violence. I think it's completely confused. I don't know. It's, why do you ask, ask my daughter? She's over there. Uh, I smacked her occasionally as a child. Have you been violent recently? Are you going to beget violence? Dr. Oh. Can we add some really? uh, yeah, and, oh, oh, yeah, and John Carnican's really uh, scientific. Um, well, I am. Yeah, 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 that's right. Uh, I, I, mean, I mean, you know, you just have to, have to be honest with yourself. Do you think doing that to a three, four, five-year-old child begets violence, right? If you think it does, you really are on another planet. And I'd like you, please... If you are politicians, why don't you try and persuade the public, okay? 75% of people do not think they should be a criminal. Why don't you try and persuade them, right, instead of beating them, right? This is, you're doing the equivalent of what you're trying to ban. Stop beating parents by criminalising them. Go out there, have public meetings. Bring your professors who can t say to them, oh, if you do that to your child, that's a form of violence that begets violence. And see what the public think of you. You are meant to be their representatives, after all, are you not? Dr. Um I, I know you were a little late to the committee. We actually spent some time at the beginning talking about how we'd gone out and spoke to parents' groups, grandparents' groups. So 
the committee is very well aware of our responsibilities to the public and our constituents. Well, it's a shame Alec. you're not listening to them then. Well, I, I don't think that's entirely fair, Dr. Wayton. And, and, and can I just do, sort of do you address... accept that the majority of parents do not support, would not well, support the criminalisation of I'm just, parents? I'm going to pause okay. this for a second. I know that everyone cares deeply about this issue, but we're going to run this committee in the normal manner, which means speaking through the chair and, and letting folk answer. So if everyone could just... Um, Dr. Wayton, you, you describe uh, physical chastisement as that, a slap on the wrist. Um, in 2003, the, the, the last time this parliament legislated on, in this area, um, we brought down restrictions on physical punishment. Those restrictions were no shaking, no headshots, and no use of implements. That's it. That is the sole limit of physical punishment in this country. So anything below the neck, um, anything, you know, even perhaps to the point of pain and, uh, and harm, um, is legitimate. So, so where do you get the suggestion that that is the sum total of the physical punishment that goes on in homes in well, Scotland? Well, it wouldn't necessarily be the sum total, but you would be criminalising that. And as far as I understand it, reasonable chastisement is still there. And if you are unreasonable, uh, you can be uh, taken to court for that. You can be uh, challenged for being unreasonable. And I think there's lots of people who would think if they saw a child being uh, strongly beaten by their parent, they would think that was unreasonable, and they would challenge that. Uh, so perhaps if you want to reword it uh, uh, to something else, then you could maybe go back and think about that. But at the minute, you will be criminalising somebody who smacks a child on the bottom or smacks their hand. That is what you will be doing. But there are many parents in this room, all of whom can attest to the feeling of losing control when disciplining their children, whether that's uh, the time out or, or shouting, or, or even some people in this room may be smacking as well. And I, I would suggest to you, sir, that, um, well, I would ask you, do you think that every family in this country who uses physical punishment always retains an element of control when they are deploying that physical punishment? No. And no, no, nor do I think they should be. You would, you would be helping that family by <coughs> arresting them. Can I ask, bring in, uh, sorry, there's quite a, co a few questions we've asked since we came back to you. Uh, guys, do you want to come in on that, Dr. Heilman? I would like very much to, to reply to that. So, um, firstly, I very much reject the notion um, that what we have done, for example, in our review is advocacy research. So what we have done is we have done a systematic search of the literature that has fit our inclusion criteria and on the impact on children we have included only those studies that looked at that prospectively so that followed the same children over time so had measures at least at two time points which is important because then you can be sure that the physical punishment has occurred before you have measured the outcome and also <coughs> most of those studies have adjusted for the initial level of problem behavior to um, rule out or to minimize the, the risk that, the, that there is um, reverse causation of what, what is going on. And the overwhelming majority of um, the studies, um, for example, on problem behavior and aggression, have found that th those children that were uh, subjected to physical punishment um, had an increased risk of problem behavior down the line. So it doesn't work. It makes that problem behavior worse. And also, um, we found there were studies that have looked at um, several time points, and those studies looked at how physical punishment and difficult behavior um, reinforce each other. And what seems to be the case is um, that the physical punishment um, makes that behavior worse, and that worse behavior then elicits harsher physical punishment, and so you end up um, with a vicious cycle. And on the um, issue of um, the um, relationship between physical punishment and abuse, that was also one of the questions that we looked at. And um, over the time frame um, we um, looked at, we had um, six individual studies um, on that link and one review, and all of them, all of them, um, found consistently that there is a link between physical punishment and um, abuse. And I think it also makes intuitive sense that probably people are not starting out by abusing their child, but that probably they're starting out by trying to punish their child, but that might then escalate into something that is abuse. And I think I would like to ask Dr. Wayton whether he would accept that Dr. there is Helman. any... Dr. Herman, the Sorry. committee members will ask the questions. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. And finally, Diego. Uh, yeah, I, I just find it shocking some of the 
argument um, made before about children not not having rights and not being subject to uh, and in having inherent rights and being treated as 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 property or as wives were treated a century ago or, or slaves even um, yes that's 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 quite appalling the, this, the second no. Dr. Whitman Dr. Whitman the second is, sorry if um, I can just pause I, I don't you don't understand can I pause everyone for a second I think this is a really important topic and we can't let it degenerate into conversations across the table Dr. Whitman Children should not be afforded less protection because of the state of uh, vulnerable vulnerability due to their um, mental and, and, and physical immaturity, as, as we know. But more protection, so they, they need more. So, um, to to afford them more protection or at least equal protection is is what the the, the state has the duty to do, to do. Uh, otherwise, it will violate the, the, the very principle of equality before the law. Um, the, the second or third point is that um, it's not, this marking is not only about ill treatment, but it has an impact on, on other rights. And, and, and the long term impact on health uh, is, is another, and the development of the child is another. And, but also in, in the understanding of the child of the world. Um, and, and the message that we want to say, send as a, as a society as a, as a, in Scotland. So, so uh, a member of the panel brought the example of, the, uh, of uh, his child. Uh, last night I asked my child, why, why is she is, uh, six years old? And I asked her why, why the, the parliament should uh, prohibit uh, uh, hitting or smacking you. And then, and she didn't talk about her. She said it's, it's because he sends them. She said because it's bad. And I say, what do you mean by, by by it's bad? It's because that means that if I if you hit me, I can go and I can hit another people. So he sends the, the wrong message, daddy. And that's that was her her point. So uh, I think it's I, I'm I'm still mesmerized by the simplicity and 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 the and the accuracy of, of children thinking. That sometimes we adults don't don't have that that ability, or we lose that ability when, when we grow up. And and, and the final point, point is that that the the European Court of Human Rights already um, revisited and, and has discussed this uh, this uh, this approach. And and in in, in the case of um, Weinstein versus Germany, just quite recently, and I found that the German go government have not violated the applicant's right to respect for their private and family life and Article 8, which is a um, um, uh, Christian religious community that uh, the children were removed from, from their, their um, parental authority and their, uh, their care because they, the children were caned and, and there was uh, a common practice there. And uh, actually the court said that uh, the German government found a fair balance between the interests of the parents and, and the best interest of the child, which should be primary, and the right to communicate and promote the religious convictions and bringing up the children, all <coughs> those together should not expose the children uh, to dangerous practices or to physical or physical harm. And the court additionally declared that it was commendable for states to prohibit in law all form forms of uh, corporal punishment on children in order to avoid no actual uh, ill treatment, but in order to avoid any risk of ill treatment. Okay, I'm going to bring in um, some other members now. Oliver Mandel. Thank you, uh, convener. <coughs> um, I wondered um, if the panel were able to, to say whether or not they ever thought it was acceptable to use physical force to regulate or manage uh, behaviour. about managing behavior, I, I don't think it's acceptable. So I don't know whether you are talking about restraint if, if you need to, I don't know, um, make sure that, that a child doesn't come to harm. Um, but in terms of inflicting pain to manage behavior, I think that is unacceptable. Yeah, I agree. Oh, is that, did you say that you agree? Sorry. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. agree. Excellent. Um, and then following on from that, do you think it's ever acceptable to restrict the rights of a child 
in order to regulate or manage their behaviour. Give me an example. Uh, well, I don't know uh, the freedoms I enjoy as an adult to <coughs> uh, choose uh, how, what, what I want to do. Do you think it's acceptable for a parent to interfere in a child's sort of right to choose what they want to do? Yes, depending on, on the circumstances. Um, I mean, I so you, you, you recognise then that a child wouldn't always have the same rights as an adult? Yes. Okay. And that's the same for all panel members? Yes, but I would want to distinguish those two conditions quite substantially because there isn't evidence that uh, restraint causes um, negative health or, or other developmental outcomes, whereas there is evidence that um, hitting a child has those effects. So they are quite substantially different. So the question of rights, for me, is, is slightly separate here from the, the question of consequences. Uh, I would dispute that. Uh, and I'd suggest if you look at the, uh, Ms. again, at uh, Mr. Lazelia's work in terms of all the, the review of all of this, then that does not bear out. And I would like to ask how you can differentiate between uh, the upset that a child feels from being grounded uh, for a week, for example, compared to uh, being having their bottom or hand smacked. Because I cannot see how in the future, if you're going to be logically consistent, you will not eventually say that that should be banned as well. Because uh, the, the, the level of vulnerability that you understand children to have is so high and their lack of resilience uh, is so uh, profound that I can't see how this can't eventually, in five, ten years' time, end up be problematizing almost any form uh, of discipline whatsoever. Uh, and, and I would like to raise a question, you know, this, this question of... Uh, just a final thing on, no, on children's rights. You're oh, not okay. here to ask questions. I, I'm sorry to be mm. direct oh, with you. They're not really questions. They're obviously they're, they're, they're rhetorical. Uh -huh. answers, okay. Anyway. Yeah. Oliver, do you wish uh, to pursue? Yeah, no, I do. Um, so, no, so do, you, do you ever see um, a circumstance... Um, in which it might be in a child's best interest to be physically punished. No, absolutely no. And, uh, and just going to so to your previous question, uh, of course, discipline discipline is important, and and um, but it's a non-violent uh, form of discipline. What should be uh, apply, and um, and 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 there is no. Uh, Quite a lot of distinction between adults and and, and, and children in terms of, of that punishment or, or discipline that you you're speaking of, because adults are also constantly restricted and and and, and some adults need discipline as well. So um, I, I don't accept the the principle of of, of that question. Yeah. And that's why we have a criminal justice system, and, and we have prisons, and, and, and punishment, as as as, as the same as rehabilitation, is a very important part of that. Yeah. So, in that case, do you think that parents are responsible for the safety and well-being of their children? Yes. So, who's responsible for my safety and well-being? You are. I'm, I'm, I'm over the age of 18. Uh, who's, who's responsible for my safety and well-being? Sorry, Maya. You appear to be blurring the, the boundaries around protection from harm and... Um, and you know, sort of other kinds of of children's uh, rights there, and I'm I'm not sure that that it's defensible logically. Uh, well, I, I I'm trying to draw out what I think is a nuanced point around where this legislation could go wrong. Uh, for example, where parents have to uh, physically restrain their children for their own safety. Uh, we saw an example of that worked through by children themselves uh, in Kirkcaldy this week at a YMCA group. Uh, where they had a young child uh, running across the road uh, repeatedly to try and get to a Mr Whippy ice cream van. Uh, and in that particular circumstance, children thought it maybe wasn't the best thing to do uh, to hit the child, but they could see uh, how, in order to prevent that incident from happening, that it would be better to be smacked uh, than to be hit by a car. Um, I'm thinking of parents who have to manage uh, you know, very difficult behaviour in their children. It might be better... Uh, the, the, than letting that behaviour es escalate. And that, that's what I've heard, uh, certainly from at least some uh, children. It's what I hear from uh, some families, um, families I have to deal with in my constituency work. So by asking these questions, I'm just trying to draw out if there's a distinction uh, between certain uses of physical force 
and, and a use of, of physical punishment. Um, but I, I didn't come in with a preconceived uh, view. I'm, I'm not sure that... I'm not sure why it would be necessary to hit a child in that circumstance. But can you understand why it might be, why it might come about? I can understand why it com can come about, but I don't really see how it's a defence for hitting a child. Holding a child back, certainly, but hitting a child, how, how will that stop them from running in front of a car? It's not a logical consequence of the child running in front of the car. The, the, you know, it, the, the two things are not connected. I think that there is an argument around the use of physical restraint, if necessary, but I don't see how that equates to being smacked. But you can understand why people might see that as a, as a, as a response in, well, in a situation where a child's safety, um, where they perceive a child's safety to be at risk or they feel under pressure. I can understand why they might feel that way, but I don't think that their view is justified. So you think they deserve to be criminalised for that, that decision? I think, again, there's a, there's a degree of artificiality in the way that this notion of criminalisation is, is playing out. No, not so, if you, it's not artificial if you're in court facing those difficult But realistically, how likely is it that, that somebody... You know, we, we have all sorts of things around child abuse that don't result in people being in court. Well, people you know, court. There, are, there are nuanced levels of response. Tell, uh, Professor Cullen, I, I'm Sorry. nice to be free-flowing, but can we just... Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so a, a sort of final uh, question on on this. Uh, you know, do do you think then uh, that it's positive uh, for uh, families to interact with the criminal justice system uh, when these sort of difficulties arise? Do you see? Uh, you talked before about the damage uh, that that physical punishment does to children. Do you recognise there's also a damage uh, of being involved with the criminal justice system? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I think it depends how you want to see the role of the criminal justice system and also what the consequences of that involvement might be. So, for instance, um, it's been evidence that uh, supporting parents who are struggling through access to positive parenting and to particularly empowerment-oriented um, interventions can be a useful way of helping them to find other ways of, of managing their children. So if interaction with the criminal justice system produces that, then yes, I can see that as positive. If it results in them to going to prison or having a fine, no, I don't think that's positive. You know, I, I think it's it's not necessarily about the act of criminalising child abuse. I think it's more about the, the the realities of the way that we manage that, and we do that in a nuanced way across the child protection system. It isn't simply the case that smacking a child will necessarily produce the outcome of a police officer coming and, uh, and taking you to court. You know, it just, it, it's much more subtle than that. So um, I guess I'd, I'd just go back and say, you know, in the context of our criminal justice system, as it exists at the moment, uh, where, fam where families do end up uh, having to, to use the current defence in court, uh, do you think that's a positive experience for those families going through that process? Well, I don't think it's a positive experience for anybody to go to court and have to defend their, their behaviours, um, but there can be positive consequences of those things. Yes. Okay, thank you. Can I just clarify this criminalisation question? Because uh, you know, people who are against smacking think that they're progressive and they don't like the idea that they are criminalising people. But can we just clarify, when you pass a law, you, we make something criminal. Right? And therefore, smacking your child will be a criminal offence. Okay? Every single parent might not end up being locked up for five years, but we will, and Professor Callahan is supporting the criminalization of smacking. So you are supporting yes. that child who is being smacked on the bottom because they're going to run across the road by that parent. You are supporting that becoming a crime. Thank you. I think we're all clear on, on what, we're, what we're doing here. Uh, Dr. Can I Can I yeah, also say something to that? So um, Physical punishment is now banned in 54 countries around the world. And within the European Union, the UK is the outlier. So the UK is one of only three uh, countries where um, there is no attention uh, or where, where it hasn't been, been banned or, or no legislation um, is, has been brought forward yet. And I think that argument of criminalization um, 
just holds less and less the more countries um, do legislate and the more we see that there is no evidence that that leads to um, an increase in prosecutions because obviously um, police has discretion that they use and that they uh, will use and I am aware that um, that has been looked at in New Zealand and I think also um, in Ireland there is at least anecdotal evidence that um, it has not uh, led to an, an increase in, in, in prosecutions of parents. No. Okay, thank you. Mary Fee. Thank you, um, Convener. A, a number of areas that, that I wanted to um, ask questions on have already been um, covered. But can I, can I perhaps just pick up on the point that's just been made about the, the UK being an outlier in, in, in introducing this legislation? Um, I, I wonder if the panel could comment on why they think that is? want to speculate, I don't have an answer to that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, also, I don't think that it's, it's, it's entrenched uh, uh, ideas. Um, uh, but what I would like to say is that uh, it's contrary to that we are, there's not the majority of, of people, individuals who are pro, uh, uh, pro smacking, but the contrary. So uh, as I say, we, we are only one of the three countries in Europe that that have uh, still uh, this uh, defense of justifiable assault, or, or they differ the name in, in different jurisdictions, Northern Ireland and England, with um, um, Belgium, um, France, and, and Czech Republic, um, which um, anecdotally, the, the family, the German family that I talk about, um, the, the, the religious community, after that moved to Czech Republic um, because they was allowed to. To, to hit the children in, 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 in Czech Republic. And so good that we are now so close to Germany. <laughs> OK, OK. Um, I wonder if I could perhaps ask the, the, the panel about um, restraint. And it was touched on in, in the questions that, that Oliver Mundell asked. But my specific question comes from restraint that's used in a residential care setting. And I suppose it might be helpful to give a bit of a background. Before I, I became um, a member of parliament, I was a, a local authority councillor and I was on an adoption and fostering panel and I visited all of the residential um, <coughs> care homes um, in my council area and I, and I saw restraint being used um, on more than one occasion. And the first time that I saw restraint being used on a young person, I found it, quite frankly, shocking and, and horrifying the level of restraint that was used on a young person. And I understand that um, restraint, particularly in residential care settings, is used as a last resort. But I'd be interested on the panel's views on whether um, this bill would be an appropriate place to perhaps deal with the issue of restraint in, in, in care settings. Um, because there is a very fine line between restraint and restraint that causes harm. And a number of young people that are in residential care have come from very traumatic, damaged backgrounds and perhaps have been subjected to violence before they have been moved in, into care. And I wonder what message restraining them um, gives them. So I'd be interested in, in, in the panel's views on, on restraint. Clarity. Mm -hmm. do, do you mean uh, physical restraint in terms of embodied physical constraint, yes. or do you mean like being closed in a room? Or no, I mean physically, I mean physical, actually physically touching. Yeah, physical. Mm -hmm. be, be, because the, the first time I saw, I I witnessed um, a child of perhaps thirteen or fourteen being physically held on on the ground by three adults. A view on that they wish to share. No. would find it difficult to answer that because I'm speaking about my review and mm. that wasn't part of the evidence that we looked at, so we really looked okay. at physical okay. punishment, so I mm. don't feel qualified to answer okay. that. I mean, I, I suppose you could expand it slightly and say that um, not necessarily, or not solely in, in residential care settings, but um, there are young people who have quite significant behavioural problems who are cared for and looked after by their parents at home. And there may be occasions when those young people are out with um, parents that the, 
the, the question of, of potentially restraining them would come into play. Sorry, just Sorry. before you come in, I wonder if this is maybe the second panel, maybe a right, better okay. place to comment on this. Okay. We should maybe... Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Happy do have, to do that. Do you have anything further on, mm -hmm. on this no. one? No. No? No. Okay, I'll bring in Fulton McGregor. Thanks, Camila. Yeah. <clears throat> and good morning, panel. Um, you know, I, I, my, my own view from the outset is I, I agree with the, the principles of this bill, but obviously we take evidence, um, you know, to hear the different views. But one thing that does kind of um, strike me is I think it's an important point for the Scottish Parliament and for the country as a whole. And if we go back a couple of generations, people here would have been quite familiar with the term. I certainly was growing up that kids should be seen and not heard. And I think, thankfully, we've moved on from that situation now. But I wonder if some of the debate around just now is, is touching on that as well, and, and there would have been very strong advocates at the time, and not to speak disrespectfully of them, because they were people of their own generation, but eh, and they're no longer here, but my grandparents, for example, would have been mm. very strong advocates of that, and I loved them both mm. dearly, I should say, but um, they would have been very strong advocates of that that, that line um, at the time. But I do think there is a, a point here that Professor Waiton brought up about taking the public with us, and certainly in the experience I've had with the the outreach um, at Dad's Rock and in discussions I've had with uh, parents and other people is I, I actually generally feel there is a mood to uh, to move. Nobody that I've spoken to wants to be seen as somebody who um, smacks their parent, it smacks their um, smacks their child, their parent, it smacks their child. But I do think that the issue is around the criminalisation aspect if they were to give a, 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 a slight smack, for example, would they be criminalised? And what I wanted to ask the panel, on it, and I do understand that it might not be the best panel, it might be more for the criminal justice agencies when we, we get them in, but how would things differ from the are just now? Now, I worked in child protection for eight years as a social worker um, as well. How would things differ from just now if, say, for example, just to give a concrete, everyday example, child goes to school, tells the school, my dad smacked me, the school then report to social work, social work investigate that. How, how will things change with this bill being implemented from where it is just now? Mm. Well, that's, that's one of my concerns. I mean, I, I assume the police are not going to run around arresting everyone for smacking their children, although that is a possibility, and the police have even mentioned themselves, well, what, what are they meant to do if this is brought to their attention? What are social work meant to do when this is brought to their attention? What is a teacher meant to do when this brought to their attention? Well, once it's made criminal, you have to do something. You can't use your judgment. You can't understand the circumstances. You can't recognise that the, you know, the, what, what, whatever was happening in terms of why uh, or anything else. Uh, you would have to have some level of intervention. So, and so, so. and, and more, 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 the, more the point is, I think, that now parents will know that they have to be frightened of their children talking to teachers, which I think is developing anyway, where, again, we become even more separate from sort of professionals and ordinary people who become nervous and frightened of things that happen in the house are going to be reported and possibly end up in some form of investigation. So, 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 so I would like to interject there, because the, the, the current guidelines and procedures as it stands just now is if an allegation is made or if it's brought to attention, as, as you describe it, then action has to already be taken. So I suppose what I'm getting at, and I, and I already said from the outset that I know that uh, the, the criminal justice agencies will, will be better placed to answer, but I'm interested to hear the, pa the, the, the panel's responses. You know, so already that would, that would um, that a process would kick in. And what I'm interested in is if the panel think that um, the police w or the criminal justice agencies would make other decisions now based on, oh, well, that defence that that parent had uh, uh, you know, of reasonable chastisement is now away. I mean, I have to say, in the eight years that I worked in social work, I never came across any joint procedure with the police where they took that into account. They took into account the circumstances as they would in any case. And if a case had to be prosecuted, they would. And that would be based on severity, common sense approach, and everything else. I'm wondering what the panel think about that. I, I think the, the um, important. Um, um, issue here is that the the bill would bring clarity to what is okay and what is not okay, and then 
the social worker or the police officer can start the conversation at a, at a different point that physical punishment is not acceptable, and then you can find different ways. And, and I don't think that that means that um, any trivial physical punishment would be prosecuted, but you have a different conversation. And actually, um, what I would also like to, to say to that is that we um, also looked at um, the um, introduction of um, the, a ban on physical punishment in different countries and how that um, affected the prevalence of physical punishment and attitudes in those countries. And um, there is a systematic review of um, legislation um, um, in 24 countries and that found that there is a decline in the prevalence of physical punishment in most countries anyway, but where you have that legislation, it declines faster. And so, so public attitudes will be um, influenced by this legislation. And um, in most of those countries, the legislation was introduced while a majority of parents were still against that ban. But you bring the public with you with those bans. And, and other um, really good explanations of um, how that can work is, is smoking legislation, where now um, you know, attitudes also shift because we have changed what, what is acceptable and, and what should be the norm. So um, I think it has um, very much um, also a symbolic value, that kind of ban and that kind of legislation. I think that there is an important distinction that we are not criminalizing a conduct. What we are doing is to remove a defense mm -hmm. to treat children equally than, than other groups. So that's, that's a, a, quite an important and significant difference. So we are not criminalizing any conduct now. Um, uh, and, and of course, there is, there is difference between uh, restraint and, and restraint for medical reasons that uh, physical punishment or, or deliberately causing suffering and, and, uh, to, to a person, either by physically uh, doing so or humiliating that, 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 that person. So th there are differences in, in terms of, of conduct. And, and the, the third point is, is I, I think what you, you raise is, is very important, and, and that's why guidance should be paramount and guidance and advice. And I am a, a, a parent, as many, many of you, and I think it's one of the most beautiful and, and challenging things that you can do in, in life. So guidance, I, I, I certainly will welcome any guidance to, to improve my parenting and, and to uh, 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 just for the benefit of, the, of that, that child in, in, in society. So I, I don't think it's, it's something that I, I don't find it at all the, the argument of, of patronizing. I, I think it's when it's provided with a, with a, some scientific a, evidence base, and, and I don't, I wouldn't find any any guidance patronizing in, in that respect. He had a supplementary. To yeah. That. Um, thank you, thank you, convener. One of the um, questions that um, we were asked when um, we, we we did our um, engagement, our outreach engagement this week was that this um, bill will criminalise parents who love their children and children who <laughs> abuse and assault their, their children will continue to do that behind closed doors. Do you agree with that? Well, that's just one of my concerns is the confusion again we seem to have. So we seem to say yes, it's, we accept we're, we're criminalising and then we say well you know, but we'll, we'll kind of be sensible. And if there's trivial, as you said, trivial physical punishment. And I don't think we talk about trivial physical punishment if we were talking about domestic violence, right, to a woman, right? But when we're talking about children, we say, well, if it's just trivial, and what's different? So we do appear to be treating children and adults differently. So at least, at least can we accept that, right? Because this is one of the arguments that we treat them differently. And to come back to the point about, I mean, is it, is it legitimate to use the law to change attitudes. I mean, this seems to be increasingly the case. I mean, I'm a criminologist, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to write a book at the minute about this type of issue. And it does seem to be increasingly the case in the last 20 years that more and more and more laws are used for more and more things that, are, that when they, they talk about we're trying to change people's behavior. Now, as far as I'm, I understand, parliamentarians are meant to be representatives of people and to some extent not like their uh, teachers. Dr. Waiten, I think Mary's looking puzzled. I think she's maybe wanting yeah, to... So, yeah, sorry, yeah. I'm, well, I'm I was I'm trying not to answer previous questions in this previous discussion. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if perhaps I've misunderstood you or you've misunderstood me, but the point that, that, that was made at the event that I attended was that um, there are loving parents who will give their children a smack in the hand or a smack in, you know, a, a quick smack in the hand who feel they will be criminalised. And the point they made was that there are parents who regularly assault and abuse their children behind closed doors and they will continue to do that and this legislation will have no impact on that. Uh, that that was the point that I was I was trying to make. It is borne out by evidence as well, apparently. But when you look at the evidence of smacking, who who the laws impact on, is that it's the parents who do light smacking now no longer use light smacking, and the parents that uh, use much heavier smacking, the law has very little impact on that. So yes, I suspect that's the case. I also suspect it's the case that children who are being seriously abused and battered might get lost in a sea of uh, complaints uh, by caring uh, professionals who, uh, who are now uh, reporting every smacking incident. Could bring in another couple of panel members, Dr. Uh, Professor Callum. Yeah, excuse me. thanks. Um, just a couple of points, actually. The, the, the first is that the notion that we don't have a nuanced response to women who experience domestic abuse or to other ideas, uh, other experiences of child abuse is fallacious. I mean, we, we do have a very textured response and it's very unlikely that a police response to uh, a woman being smacked would be the same as somebody being severely beaten. So I think that that's, that's erroneous anyway. Um, in relation to the query around, uh, around degrees of abuse within the family, I think one of the advantages of this legislation is it actually gives a clear message to children about the status of physical violence. Um, I think that one of the, the issues that we have in, in families where violence is used routinely is that there's a normalisation of it, mm. and it can be very difficult for children to make sense of the violence that they're experiencing and what is acceptable and what is not. Giving a clear message that it is never acceptable is very important. It helps those children more. So I would suggest, and I'm not sure what evidence... Um, Dr. Waiton is referring to here, um, but you know, I, I'm not aware of any evidence that suggests that it's the case that um, you know that, that, that abuse behind closed doors either intensifies or doesn't come to the attention of the authorities as regularly in the manner that he's just suggested. So I think that that that, that it can only pop be positive for children who experience mm. abuse to actually make a clear message that abuse is never acceptable. Dr. Hellman, did you want to come in back on that? Yeah, so, so I very much uh, second <coughs> that. And in that review I just mentioned that looked at the impact of, of that legislation, um, it was also found that um, instances of severe abuse um, reduced in those countries that have um, implemented a ban on physical punishment. Thank you. Um, Gail Ross, can I? Thank you, convener, and uh, my apologies for coming in late. Um, I am actually really disappointed to have missed the, the first part of the meeting. Um, when we're talking about concerns, um, one of the concerns that we heard, whether it's correct or not, is that there might be an increased burden on public services if there are more cases coming forward, um, pro possible prosecutions, and obviously with a change in the law, there's going to have to be an awareness raising campaign as well. So how do you think that we should go about that if, if the bill does come to pass? And do you think that there will be any additional burdens on, on the public services? From um, studies that has also have compared um, countries where there were changes in the law and countries that have also at the same time run awareness campaigns, that shows that um, this is much more effective to do both at the same time. So it's really important, obviously, when you introduce um, legislation that you also tell people about it and that, that you... Um, so, so, yeah, you will have to spend um, some resources on, on a campaign like that. And one of our recommendations is also that um, parents will need support in, in, in positive parenting uh, strategies. Um, so, yes, you probably also will um, um, need resources to, to do that. And But, you know, we didn't do an economic evaluation or anything, so I, I cannot uh, speak on how much that would be. Yeah, definitely would be yeah. uh, an impact in them. But, of course, um, there is a, a need to, those goes hand in hand, and then 
if the bill goes ahead and, and, and the removal of the defense gas has to go hand in hand with the with the promotion of not only the awareness that that, that the law has changed which is, is very important but with the promotion of positive and, and non-violent respect respectful approaches to to child discipline uh, which is, is, is important and the participation of children in in the design of those approaches so yeah, there has to be a greater dissemination of, of all that in all places um, where families and, and, and children are, and everything from libraries, and schools, and so uh, training and guidance is is very important and is, is, is crucial. That was um, one of the the pieces of feedback that we had from a, an external meeting that we went to, was that a lot of parents felt that the use of um, f physical punishment, smacking, whatever you want to, to term it, was a last resort, a frustration on the behalf of the parent. You know, sometimes it was nothing to do with the behaviour of the child, it was the frustration. And, and that was something that they put forward was um, more positive parenting courses, more uh, support and the ability to be able to say to your child without having to actually hit them. And, and yes, yeah, so that came across very strongly. Supplementary. Uh, um, I'm just wondering if any of your research um, has, uh, or any of your experience has indicated how often the defence of justifi justifiable assault has been actually used, because so far and over very early stages, I seem to find it quite difficult to establish uh, a number. That's not something we have looked at, so because we looked at the, the impact of physical punishment on children. As far as I'm aware, it's hardly ever been used, which suggests that this isn't, it's not being raised in this way. I mean, could I just make a point about the resources? I, th I, think, I think the point about the resources is it shouldn't matter. Right? If we are to take seriously the arguments that are promoting this, that an act, a smacking a child is an act of violence that we should see as the same as an act of violence against another adult, like an act of violence against a woman, or if we're going to <laughs> equate it to the treatment of slaves, as it has been done, right, the sort of the attitude and action. If that is what smacking a child is, then we should use all resources there are to, to stop it. Of course, the reality why we're asking this question and scratching our head a little bit is because we don't think that most people smacking their children is that, because it isn't. Right? It is not a form of violence in the way that we think of it in terms of adults, which is why we th are thinking about this a little bit differently, which is why I would again suggest you think again before making this a criminal offence. OK. Annie Wells, you've not had a, a, a chance to come in yet. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, we, I went out and visited a, a church in, in Glasgow, and having looked at the, the public opinion that we've seen in various polls, um, YouGov panel base and Comres polls from 2017, 2018, we don't have the public's support on this bill. Now, I think as parliamentarians and as this parliament tries to do, we try to represent the people that elected us to be here, and that is representing public opinion. So how would you suggest that we can bring the public on this journey with us, and I would see that being more through education, more through information about how to, how to discipline your child, because I don't believe that we should be making parents feel criminal or grandparents or carers. That is my personal opinion. And if you look at 74%, 54% of the general public feel exactly the same. So how do we bring the public on this journey with us? Previously, one of the key things for me is the prevention of child abuse. And I think that most people, most reasonable people... Excuse, sorry, um, can I just... I'd like you to let the panel answer, Annie. Yeah, I think most reasonable people would agree that the prevention of child abuse is, is incredibly no, important. I, 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 sorry, convener. I am not saying about child abuse. I know, I am I know that. I'm getting somewhere... Just to get sorry, can I just record. finish my thought and it'll be clear how I'm answering your question. The question of, of child abuse... Um, is, is so yes. serious, I think, in our culture, and the confusion around what justifies, you know, what's justified and what's not in parenting practice feeds into it. 
So I think, you know, if we make it clear to members of the public that what we're attempting to do is protect children, I can't see how any reasonable opposition could be brooked in relation to that. There was also significant resistance to the introduction of coercive control, um, and we nonetheless went with the evidence base around that, which suggests that it sustains family violence. The evidence suggests that smacking sustains family violence. It doesn't have a place in a civilised culture. Um, I answered that question um, when I spoke earlier um, about what the evidence also shows, that legislating means that the attitudes also change faster in those countries where legislation uh, has been brought forward. So um, by legislating, you will influence social norms, you will influence what becomes acceptable and, and what is not, so you will influence attitudes by um, introducing such legislation. In most countries, it has been introduced without the majority of public uh, support at the time it was introduced. So it's the right thing to do. Yeah, it, it is. Yes, you are representing people, um, but that is also, as, as you said, it's, it's, the, it's the right th thing to do. And it's two and three, um, the you also have the obligations to to take measures to protect the 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 best interest of the child, uh, to protect the dignity of the child, and um, so the, the, there is no only one one. Uh, task that, that you are doing as a legislator, and, and that's, that's uh, sometimes it's a difficult one, but you have to take the right one, and, um, and within a legal context, you have that obligation. Uh, I mean, I think it's a really good question, and I think the, a <laughs> the answer in part is given by the response, because uh, I think when you go to parents and uh, uh, essentially say, uh, when you smack your child, you're, you're on the tra trail towards child abuse. They will look at you with horror and disgust mm -hmm. uh, and think you're living on another planet and think that you are contemptuous of them uh, who have, uh, many of whom will have smacked their children and love their children and would never abuse their children uh, and live amongst other people who do likewise and know that that is not actually uh, the reality. Uh, for the vast, vast, vast majority of people who do not abuse their children. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that really degraded view of people seems to be what underpins uh, what appears on the surface to be a progressive uh, uh, approach to things is actually a very anti-human, negative, patronising and elitist uh, outlook about ordinary parents who, who smack their children, love their children, and would never abuse their children. Thank you. you can Done. Do. Okay. Um, we have uh, Gordon Lindhurst, MSP, visiting the committee this morning. I believe you have a question you'd like to ask. Yes. Um, thank you very much, convener. Um, can I just say in starting, uh, I do, don't necessarily entirely agree or entirely disagree with what has been said by any any of you um, we've got limited time so I want to perhaps address my questions to Diego Quiroz because uh, probably mispronounced your name sorry because um, it's about aspects of law now uh, I have in my previous job as an advocate prosecuted parents in court for um, smacking their children uh, because that's what happens at present if, I think as Fulton McGregor correctly said, if the police look at all the issues, social work and so forth, it's, it's looked at, a decision is then taken not by the police ultimately but by the procured fiscal whether prosecution happens or not. So I mean first of all of course I'd have to disagree with you that this doesn't change things in terms of the criminal law that parents would face because ultimately all that's in the bill, as currently drafted, of course, there's the possibility of amending it, stage two, is that the defence open to parents, um, if charged with assaulting their child, is removed, and it simply becomes, or is the common law, offence of assault. And the um, concerns that people have about that, because that there are reasons for these concerns, I think, and valid reasons in law, and I'm just interested to see if you... Uh, agree on this because 
If we look in terms of other countries and the way they've approached it, they've not approached it by making it a common law offence. So, for example, in Germany, it's part of the, the criminal code, it's set in the criminal code. Uh, it's defined in Sweden, uh, in New Zealand. So, some of the points made, for example, um, Dr. Heimann talked about the police deciding if a prosecution proceeds. Now, for example, in New Zealand, under the Crimes Act 1961, Section 59, Subsection 4, it's specifically provided that the police have the discretion, I'm quoting from the Act, police have the discretion not to have matters go further. So the difficulty is, on that point, for example, in Scotland, the police do not decide if the matter goes to prosecution or not. It's the prosecution service. And looking beyond that, um, the approach to crimes... It, sorry, I, perhaps I'll try, I'll try and... Question. Be, yeah. So the question is, do you, um, would you consider that there are other matters that might need to be looked at if the law is changed, if we move on from the first point about you know, the disagreement about whether or not the law should change, there are other things that need to be addressed in the law as it stands because this is just a common law offence and there's no statute of limitations, unlike in Germany, Sweden, New Zealand. I, I haven't I haven't looked at, uh, at that into uh, into that extent, um, so I'll have to take some time and, and get back to you with with, with an answer. Um, yeah, just just to be brief and because of the time, yeah. though, I'll have to think about that. But but do you accept that something that should possibly be looked into? I I. I, I agree that it's, it's different because there is no uh, there is no codify as in civil law um, and uh, but are the the consequences different? I, I don't know. I will have to look at that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We also have John Finney, MSP, with us, um, whose bill it is. Do you wish to ask any questions uh, or no, thank contribute? You very much, okay. In which case, can I thank all the panel members for joining us um, this morning and sharing their opinions with us. And we'll suspend for around five minutes now to let the panels change.
Okay, uh, welcome back everybody and can I welcome our um, second panel this morning to give evidence on children equal protection from Assault Scotland Bill. We have um, Claire Simpson who is um, the manager of Parenting Across Scotland, Dr Louise Hill, Policy Implementation Lead at Centre for Excellence for Looked After Children, Amy Beth Mia who's a member of um, who Cares Scotland Collective and Cheryl Ann Cruikshank, Director of Operations at Who Cares Scotland. You're all very welcome this morning. And if I could start by asking you um, the same opening question that I asked the, the first panel. <coughs> Do you support the Bill's aims to help bring an end to the physical punishment of children? Claire. Yes, um, Parenting Across Scotland, we're a partnership of different children's organisations, family organisations. And the eight members of PAS are completely in agreement that it seems unfathomable to us that in the 21st century it is still a defen defensible to hit a child, but not. But if you were, if I was to hit one of you today, I would have no defence. If I were to hit my child, although he's now beyond that age, that would be in. You know, there would be a defence for that. That that doesn't seem right to us. Okay, thank you. Dr Hill. Thank you for the invitation to come this morning and uh, delighted to be here. Um, yes, we welcome the bill. We think it's overdue and we are delighted to support it in any way we can. We think it modernises the law to actually reflect um, the strong value base that we have towards children's rights. We feel that the, the progression that we've made in the political landscape has been significant over the the last kind of decade or so for children, so we think that this is a natural um, next step for us. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to just take the opportunity, first of all, just to thank you for, for allowing me to be in this space today. Thank you for coming. Also, just to give you a bit of background about myself and to kind of introduce myself, um, I've actually had social work involvement for as long as I can actually possibly remember as far back. Um, I've had a lot of different placements throughout my life, so many I don't actually remember, so I can't give you a number, I'm afraid. Um, I can tell you that the longest I've ever had has been four and a half years. The shortest has probably been about four hours, um, as I was placed in the wrong local authority. Um, so one of the, the areas within this bill, although I'm a, a big supporter of the bill, is that there's a grey area. Um, I find that at the moment what we're talking about when people are being removed, children are being removed from the, their family home to be placed in care, we are the state then becomes parents, they become the, the, the child's corporate parent. And suddenly it's a case of, it's okay for them to be restraining these young people and to be acting in almost an, an assault-like manner and breaching human rights. But on the other hand, we're, we're wanting to take away being able to smack children, which I think we should be encouraging, we should be putting this bill in place. However, there's, there's a whole grey area that we've, we've okay. left out. Thank you. I think um, committee members will want to come to that later. Thank you. Okay, yeah, um, I'd like to say on behalf of Hooker Scotland that we welcome the intent within this bill and we give our full support to its aim of ending physical punishment of children by parents and carers, by abolishing the defence of reasonable chastisement. Diego talked helpfully earlier about this bill redefining what is acceptable in terms of protecting the child's right to dignity. We'd like to see this redefining extended to protect the dignity of all children from physical punishment or assault, including those who are looked after. We also heard earlier that there is no international treaty supporting a parent's right to physically punishing their child. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, trying to join, join in Hooker Scotland as an independent advocate in 2001, I also worked in residential childcare and I was trained in restraint. I've witnessed restraint, as Mary Fee said earlier, uh, both as a residential childcare worker and as an advocate, um, and hear regularly from our advocacy practitioners about their experience of witnessing restraint, and it, it's that subject that we want to discuss with you today. Okay, thank you all. Um, 
Elko Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning to the panel. Thank you very much for your coming today and your, the evidence you've supplied with us with already. Um, I'd like to start by touching on something that Annie Wells said in the last panel, and a number of you were present to hear that, and that is that uh, there is controversy around this bill and public opinion at the present time is not in favour of the change we are seeking to implement here. Um, so I'd like to ask whether we as politicians should always follow public opinion, because I'm minded that the abolition of the death penalty did not command public support at the time but that has since changed um, should we always follow public opinion as opinion polls tell us start I suppose I would start by saying that in my opinion ever legislation ought to be evidence informed and my understanding of a representative democracy is that we represent the people well I don't you you represent the people in your constituencies and you represent their best <coughs> interests. Given what we know, and given the compelling evidence that we heard from Professor Hillman today about the harm that this causes, I think that it's entirely fitting and appropriate to meet legislation <coughs> that prevents harm, that sends a clear message to parents, that tells them, I think the overwhelming majority, the, the vast majority of parents want to do the best for their child. I think quite a lot of them they don't know the evidence that Professor Hillman has come up with. I, I don't think many of them are going to sit and read a long evidence view, but, review, but I think it is our duty in the kind of information that we provide for parents, be it through things like our website, Scottish Government's Parent Club, Health Visiting, it is our duty to educate about what, what the best methods are and what harms. And I think it's, it, it's time, if we do this, we need to do it with a good public education campaign, public information campaign, and to ensure that, that there is family support. Professionals in Sweden said to me that one of the things the clarity in the law offered to them was that parents would say, I know this is against the law, but I've been driven to the end of my tether and I don't know what to do. And it offered opportunities for dialogue and support. And I would say that that's what we need to to create. I would also say that we need to make sure we put proper resources into a public information campaign. When the smoking ban was, it, was introduced, we allocated three million for the first year and one million for each of the subsequent years. I'm not advocating something on the scale of that, but I think we do need to adequately assess what we need because we were able as a country, to divert people from harmful behaviour and smoking, we need to do the same thing and offer proper supports to parents. I just think that a, a thing to highlight as well is children don't actually know. So, for example, yesterday was me just realising that a lot of the restraint that I went through was actually an invasion of my human rights. I didn't know that until I actually sat down and was preparing my notes for today. Um, the, the woman earlier who sat where I'm sat at the moment had said that it's important that we do this because we need to send out a clear message to children that this isn't OK. So going back to what you were saying there of the public actually probably don't even know right now and aren't aware and children aren't aware. So how can they make that informed decision of saying that it's not okay and if we're polling them and asking them right now because they don't have the knowledge and the education to then back that up. So I think it's about informing them. Yeah, um, I think Amy was mentioning Professor Callahan there and she talked of normalisation of violence and this bill sends a clear message to children that physical abuse is never acceptable and we fully support that. Our members talk similarly about physical restraint and how it quickly became an accepted part of their experience of care, despite the law being quite clear that it should only ever be used in exceptional circumstances and only if it's the only practical means of securing the child or another person's welfare. Um, yet we have regularly um, heard from young people that restraint is used for behavioural management and to compel the child to comply. We do also support the need for a public education campaign um, more broadly than, than uh, universally around how we care for our children, but also how we care for our children who are looked after by the state. I think, I think one, of the, one of the things that really is important and kind of symbolic about legislation like this is about how we value and respect children and young people in our society. And I think... 
though, in, in listening to your constituents and, and the public opinions on it, part of that for me is saying that for some parents and carers, it's about the kind of knowledge of well, what else do I do? This is the last resort. What you know, support me then as the as the state and our, our through our elected members and our local authorities. Support me to know well, well, what is a different parenting strategy? How am I supposed to to know that they've not got all the access that perhaps some of us have? So, I think that that's the opportunity to say you know the. The really good work that was done in the National Parenting Strategy mm. has some great kind of ethos and values underneath it. But as part of that, it was kind of, there should be a whole campaign and awareness around different approaches that, that families can then have to be able to kind of engage with and parent in different ways. Um, can I just pick up as well? Is that okay? So, so some of the comments earlier that were made um, just around kind of carers. And I think it's just important to know that the... The physical punishment for <coughs> children that are cared for in foster care and kinship care, um, that has not been allowed for a, for a long time, and it's actually in the 2009 regulations. So children that are growing up in foster care and formal kinship care um, sh should not have any form of corporal punishment against them. And also it's a basic social work check that's done, even in um, other placements where there's any engagement from social work, that there'd be a knowledge of whether or not um, there would be a line from social work that we would not expect any level um, of physical punishment of children. Um, just to mention when you're saying there about um, kinship care and foster care, so my, my confusion and why I think that we, we should be abolishing it altogether is where is that line? So we have a child that is in foster care, myself personally, um, before. I was then moved into residential care where suddenly it became okay to restrain me. However, restraint was never explained. I'd never witnessed restraint, restraint until suddenly I had four people sat on top of me, one of which was a sergeant in the army, one of which was a bouncer in the nightclub, and one was a female over, the, over six foot. But these people were sat on top of me suddenly and I had no idea what restraint was. So where is that line? Suddenly, because we're no longer in foster care, that we're now in restraint, that it's okay to now do this. Why is that? Why are we allowing that to then happen? Okay, thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, if I can unpack um, some of your answer there, Dr Hill. Um, we heard a discussion in the previous panel about best interests, and, and I think what you're talking about in that sort of um, discussion between a constituent and an MSP about, well, what do I do then? I get to the end of my tether. How do I act and parent in the best interests of my child? This also speaks to that tension I referred to between this well, perceived tension between parents' rights and children's rights. Um, can you describe, we, we, we're quite, um, it's advantageous that 54 countries have been down this road before us. In that experience, um, what has the state done to provide alternatives for parents? Okay, thank you. Um, I think what's what's critical is that the legislation in itself can only be ever seen as one 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 small part. I know it doesn't feel like a small part at this stage of the debate, obviously, but one part of that whole kind of culture change in which you're trying to to achieve the change. So. Um, not only the public awareness campaigns at the time of legislation passing, but recognising that we're becoming parents all the time. So it's an ongoing commitment to our awareness kind of campaign around it. Also, I think really investing in all the kind of some, the family support programmes that are required. It's not they, there's obviously a lot of evidence we can talk around around different kinds of um, family family support and different particular parenting programs but it's actually more about the the knowledge that can that the ability i suppose to share um all the different kind of support that can be for families in the sense of um the the great kind of ready steady baby kind of materials that are provided with more information in there the clarity that can be provided um I'm very frustrated because I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old. So, um, so it's kind of thinking through all the kind of ways in which you kind of have access to those materials and what just becomes, I suppose, normalised. You know, what becomes like through the baby box, through all the different great endeavours that we've got. And yet we still have this anomaly in our legislation that we're still accepting justifiable assault of children. So it's, there's some great work that's been done. So it's about how we kind of build on all that in some really gentle ways. And then we can also build up some more parenting programmes. So... 
Oh, it's my time. The youngest. Hello. Um, so as regards the efficacy of, of those approaches and how they've happened in the 54 countries that have gone before us in that, if we take the example that Oliver Mundell raised of the child running into traffic, um, has there been a dramatic upsurge in children running into traffic in the 54 countries that have already adopted this change? I don't think so. <laughs> Sorry, but I have not done any evidence on that to show. But on that point, I suppose one of my reflections is that my response of having very small children, and if they run into traffic, my, my immediate response is, is to hold them, is to, I, I get hold of my children and I keep them safe. Yeah. And that's what so much of our really good guidance and policy is around children. We want to hold them and care them and look after them. My immediate response to a child would not be to hit them for running over to the ice cream van. It would be to hold them and then to talk to them and to get down alongside my child and say, you know, this is why it's dangerous and sit there and point it out, not, not to hit them as a response of it. Claire Simpson, you were wanting to come back in. I'd like to point out, in a way, we've, we've talked quite a bit about the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I think quite often people see it, obviously it is about the rights of the child, but sometimes people see it in a really kind of oppositional or adversarial way, as it's about the rights of child as against families. And in fact, of course, the UNCRC places the child very firmly in the context of the family and says that family is the best place for the child. And what it goes on to say is that state has a duty to provide a support and help to parents in that role. And I think that you know, the government, Scottish government, has talked about putting the principles of the UNCNC into law in terms of um, its programme for government. I think this is the first step on the way. Mm -hmm. And I found myself quite surprised in the last session to agree with one of the things that um, Dr. Waiton said, where he said that parents should be supported and not undermined. And I see this bill as an opportunity to do that. It will provide clarity. It will send a clear message mm -hmm. to parents about what is harmful. And then we need to offer them the support, as Louisa said so much said that um, we need to offer them the supports to be able to do that. Okay. Thank you. Mary Fee, do you wish to come yes, in on uh, your questions? Th thank you, um, Convener. I just wanted to follow up on the, the, the points that were made around um, restraint. Um, and obviously, as I said in the earlier session, the first time I saw restraint being used, I found it quite, um, quite shocking. Um, and, and obviously, restraint is, is used in, in the, a residential care setting. It's also used in the, in the secure care setting. Um, and I am aware that it has been used on occasion in specialised schools that um, support young people with quite severe behavioural problems. And, <coughs> and the explanation that, that I was given around um, restraint being used, it was not to discipline, but it was to protect. Um, and I would be interested... Um, particularly in, in the representatives from um, Who Cares, on what their view on that is, um, whether it does actually protect. And, and there is a very fine line between restraint and assault. Um, and, and if restraint was to be included in this bill, would we then need to look at the issue of, of parents who care for children who have quite significant behavioural problems and are in a, a public setting and may need to use some degree of restraint on the child um, to protect them? If you don't mind, I've got two points on yeah. this. The first being that um, I, I do a lot of work with Who Cares Scotland and I am on the collective at the moment. So I actually done my own research um, and asked 40 care experienced people within that um, what their opinions were on being restrained and whether or not they found it to be safe. Um, so I, I think it's really important some of the things that I've got to say. However, there's, there's plenty of evidence out there. So I've got some very brief quotes from um, some people that might just add to that. Um, so there was, um, for example, we have one here. Where is it? Sorry, bear with me. I'm just trying to find it here. Um, there was one where someone had actually said that four guys lying on top of you, if it's not done right, it doesn't help you. It only makes matters worse. You're in your room after, raging to get back out there and start all over again. Sometimes they take you down wrongly and it hurts you. It also means that you can have carpet burns on your face and the staff can then use that as an excuse to say that you're self-harming, but you're not. And I think that's important to, to put that out there, that it does cause self-injury. 
um, going back to what you were saying about being in the public, there was a time where I'd actually been um, going to CAMS and CAMS had actually said to me that in times that you feel yourself getting to a point like that where you may end up getting restrained, remove yourself from that situation. Take yourself away from that and recognise that actually you're in control of your behaviour. And I tried to do that and on one occasion... I was actually, I removed myself from the situation. I left the children's unit to be followed out the door by three members of staff who chased me down the street, pinned me down to the ground whilst people were going by just doing their daily business. And for me, that was dehumanising. That was absolutely, there was people walking by who were witnessing me going through that. And you know, some people actually picked up the phone to phone the very people that were looking after me, which was social services, to report that this girl was being pinned down by three people. So the, the very people who are supposed to be, be providing this care, in fact, are the ones actually doing this. And I think that that's something that we need to keep in our minds when we're considering this as well. Okay. That's a really powerful point, Amy. I think it's important to recognise, and I'm sure committee are aware, that the vast majority of children enter the care and protection system due to experiencing abuse and neglect. Mm. The impact of this abuse can be lifelong, and they have told us, our members have told us, that to recover, they need to feel safe, respected and loved. Um, we know that both feeling safe and having at least one loving, stable relationship is crucial for children to heal from past trauma and enable them to build trust and safe and care in relationships. So restraining children is legally permitted uh, within residential childcare settings under the regulation of care requirements as to Care Services Scotland Regulations 2002. However, it should only be used if it is the only practicable means of securing the welfare of that child or another person. Um, it's also... Um, within the Hold and Safely guidance that has been commissioned by government was produced in 2005 and updated in 2013. It also states within that that it should be used as a last resort. Um, there have been a number of reports and inquiries that um, predate these regulations that have highly highlighted concerns around the use of restraint, including Pin Down in 92, the Kent Report in 97, the Edinburgh Inquiry in 1999 and the Fife Independent Inquiry in 2002. And post these uh, regulations, there was also the Care Law Inquiry in 2009, and that identified inappropriate and excessive use of restraint as contributing factors within an abusive care environment that not only failed to protect the children and young people in their care, but further exacerbated their trauma and exclusion. Allegations constituted a substantial list and included physical assault, some of it arising from the inappropriate use of restraint, including making children compliant through causing pain. So there is a very fine line between restraint and physical assault. Yeah. I mean, do you have any evidence that, that when restraint is used, it is used as a last resort? I mean, is there, from, from personal experience, I mean, is there an escalation to you get to the point where restraint is used? Because certainly when I saw it, there appeared to be no es escalation. Um, for, for me, that's what I think that we're, we're missing out of the picture. People don't just go from zero to 100 uh, with no time. Mm. There is a, there's a process that normally happens within that. So I believe that when people or like professionals are going on these courses to learn about restraint, they're supposed to be taught um, that it is a last resort. However, our evidence has actually shown that, that it's not been. Young people don't actually know, one, why are they being restrained? And two, who makes that call? Where is the line? There is a quote from a young person of 14 years of age who said that she was restrained for simply throwing a feathered pillow. Now, it's a feathered pillow. What damage is she going to do with that? She's not putting anyone in any sort of immediate danger. However, what we're finding is, is that there isn't that there's a very fine line with it and, and who's dictating that. Um, also, it's important to mention as well the threat. So a lot of these young people, it's not just the case of the restraint itself. There's that woman threat all of the time, which is emotional abuse, in my opinion, that you're living and it's a way to regulate and control behaviour. It's not been used as a last resort from mm -hmm. my experience and from many others that we're hearing from. Mm. And if... Sorry. 
Um, just to kind of add to Amy's point, um, we provide advocacy services um, in 30 of the 32 local authorities in Scotland. And some of those um, services have um, agreements whereby we will be notified <laughs> where a child has been injured in a restraint and have an opportunity to go and talk to that child. Um, practice in this area varies widely and there is evidence um, from research that we've conducted as far back as 1997 that um, physical restraint can sometimes be the first resort um, and isn't always used as a last resort and is sometimes used as behavioural management. Um, and that for us is hugely concerning um, and we we have highlighted the impact of restraint on children and young people's emotional well-being um, in a number of reports that, that we've produced over the years. Um, one of the challenges with this is that there is no nationally collected data on restraint within residential care settings. Local authorities are required. Um, th there's actually no um, kind of authorised methodology of restraint, and local authorities are required to um, define for themselves what the appropriate training for their staff is and to also record incidents of restraint um, and to have those independently reviewed. Um, but we haven't seen any recent evidence or research into that or the efficacy of restraint within the care setting. Okay, I'm going to move us along and we can, we can come back if there's space. Um, Fulton McGregor. It's going to be there. Um, and good morning, uh, panel. Um, I, I'm going to ask again um, what I asked at the last panel, and it's, it's definitely not a trick question by by any manner or means. I'm, I'm just wondering if any of the panellists here are aware through the research or um, work in the area of how often the defence of justifiable assault is or has been used. Um, I'm not, if I'm completely honest. It's, it, it is there. It is there to be used. I believe it's not often used, but having said that, a removal of the defence. When we've looked at criminalisation in other countries, looking at ERA, it hasn't increased criminalisation of parents. The report to the Minister of Social Development and Employment on the effects of legislative reform in New Zealand, which looked at it from 2007 to 2013, he said... In summary, I've not been able to find any evidence to show that parents are being subject to unnecessary state intervention for occasionally lightly smacking their children or any other unintended consequences. There were actually eight extra prosecutions in New Zealand over that time period, not the hundreds of thousands that we've been led to believe might occur. I'm sorry, that doesn't totally answer your question. It, it, Slightly it, goes off. It, it really does, actually. It does, Good. because it's the, it's the area I'm looking at as it is in terms of this aspect of uh, criminalising um, parents. And I think that you, you, you've actually um, summarised it really well. And I do appreciate what Gordon Linder said at the end of the, the last panel. And I think there's a technical issue there for the bill. However, for me, do, do the panel uh, not agree that this gets to what I think that the nub of the bill is, and you know, John Finney can also correct me, is it's not about criminalising parents. It's actually about sending out a strong message that um, and, and, and making the law clearer, clearer to everybody. No, yeah. was one quick point. Um, sitting on an implementation group that Scottish Government has set, has set up to look at some of the issues, if the bill were to be passed, <clears throat> and the police and the procurator fiscal sit on that group. Unfortunately, we haven't been, there's only been two meetings of the group, so I haven't been in the same room at the same time as them. But my understanding is that the police and the procurator fiscal's office, the police see that there would still be a screening mechanism and an assessment, which would happen in any case, and that sometimes that would be referred on to the fiscal's office and sometimes not. One of the cases, because it always seems to be the thing that people cite, is what if a child ran into the road? And they said that, I mean, as Louise said, most of us, whether it be adult or child, would pull them back, you know. But actually, if they were a smack, a light smack in the heat of the moment, the police said that generally that would not be considered assault. Whereas if you then said to your child, right, you really, you know, as something after the event that you assaulted them, then that would. And there was a clarity and a distinction about the kind of, 
you know, heat of the moment and an assessment that that was not a me method of physical punishment. Yeah. I support Claire's points. Um, in terms of the kind of international research, what it had indicated is there's not any increase in prosecutions as a result of the change in legislation. What there is a, which we think is a huge positive, is um, a decrease in the use of physical punishment to children and a decrease in physical abuse. And it's all around kind of that culture change that can happen as part of it. So I understand the, the concerns mm -hmm. about raising the prosecution um, rates, but they've certainly not been founded in any evidence so far internationally. Um, I don't know if it's useful at this point to say something about the kind of resources question. And no, well, I'll come later to that. Yeah. Sorry. So, so, so I just wanted to clarify about the point you were, you were making there. You, you feel that if this bill is passed, that it won't have the effect of, of more prosecutions no. for parents, but will have the effect of um, possibly being a, a, a huge influencer on effectively taking Scotland out of the Victorian era in some of these aspects. <laughs> I think so. I, in, in, a, in a way, if we look at it from a kind of bell curve kind of approach of um, a more kind of public health model of how we, you know, we respect our, our children and young people, that actually there could be a, a reduction in prosecutions as a result because of that culture change that then happened. Also around that kind of continuum that we've spoken about in terms of child abuse and neglect, that actually if we start to shift our attitudes towards children and young people, if we can shift it in that direction, then we could also have a reduction in prosecutions in that area because our parenting and the level of support that comes with it has changed and evolved. Sorry to come back one more time, but I think... You know, your question in some ways also links up to the question of public opinion. And I think that public opinion often, you know, opinion polls are quite a blunt tool. And quite often when you see, you, see them, you start asking other questions. I think some of the public opinion is actually around the fear of criminalisation. And that's a message that we have to get over, that that's not the intent, and it's about support rather than criminalisation. I think with parents' attitudes to smacking, <coughs> if you look at things like calls to parent line, you find that actually there's a num quite a number of parents call who have smacked, and they're concerned, they regret it, they recognise it as not a useful method of behaviour management. And when you look at sort of various polls like um, Growing Up in Scotland, Ipsos Murray polls that we've done, Millennium Cohort Studies, Parents often say that, yes, they have. It's a declining number, and the younger group of population are more in favour of a ban and smacking than the older cohort. The present parents are more in favour and less likely to use smacking. But what people... The other disparity is that people who've smacked actually say that it's not an effective method of parenting. So... We're not using it to achieve behaviour change. We're using it because people have lost control. I'm not sure what that teaches a child. We're using it predominantly on children who are between three and five years old. And surprisingly, this always surprises me, on disabled children. And I think those are the majority of children that are smacked. And when we look at that, that is about communication. It's about the frustration of small children who actually can't communicate, so maybe they lash out, maybe there's a frustration on their parents, and they lash out back. But we have to get over that. We have to find ways of communicating to parents about how to communicate with children <coughs> at that stage and how to employ positive parenting strategies. Fulton, I'm going to let him move on to Gail, okay. just now, if that's OK. Gail. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, we are going to come to the resources question now. You'll be glad to know. Um, interesting to hear that, um, th that there's been no increase in prosecutions in other countries. And in your opinion, a good awareness campaign, which is what I'll come on to in my second question, might actually decrease the rates that we're looking at. So um, I'm going to let you have your um, opinion on how much resources should we be putting into this? Well, I suppose... <laughs> I think it was a reflection of looking at what resources we were putting around the smoking ban and where public opinion was on that and all the change that was needed on it and I think Claire cited the figures before that we were looking at a kind of a three million pounds of investment on public awareness raising, public health messaging. Um, 
and I think there's twenty thousand in the for 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 the public awareness that's in this. And I think if you're looking at how you actually want to achieve culture change, um, I think that I think that that's a very very small sum and an incredibly ambitious um, the the aim and the aspiration. I think which is in the policy memorandum that's part of this legislation. <coughs> I just worry that actually this, the, that it won't have the successes that we all could hope for because it can't lead to that level of culture change without all the other parts that are required. And I think that that's the thing that legislating in itself is only one part of achieving that big kind of picture. So I think that that was one of my concerns. I'll okay. come back to So <clears throat> to go on to, um, in fact, just one more question before I go on to the actual public awareness campaign and how that might look. Um, would you see this money being put in at the moment as almost a preventative spend measure? Because if we are going to stop adults becoming um, maybe a chaotic lifestyles further down the road by introducing this measure, it is almost preventative spend. I, I absolutely would be of that opinion. And I think Professor Callahan's evidence that shows of the impact, the mental health impact <coughs> for children and young people into the future. You know, I think that if we frame it that way, this is an excellent example of preventative spend. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> okay. You said, is it almost preventative spend? I think it's absolutely preventative spend. I think it's about public awareness and public information. And the other thing that it absolutely has to be about is family support services. You know, um, Parenting Across Scotland is actually a coalition, a, a partnership of charities. And at the minute, we are seeing budget cuts all over Scotland in family support services. At a time where there's austerity and poverty, and the services are needed more than ever, the resources are less there. We have to guard against that now, and we have to guard against that in the future, because actually it is those support services working with families that are able to achieve the results, <coughs> the good results for children and for whole families that we need. So the results has to be in public information for this bill, but it has to be accompanied by family support. Um, in some of our um, written evidence from the um, Evangelical Alliance say that investment in education would be a more proportionate way to tackle this rather than legislation. What's your opinion on that? I think you need lots of pieces of the jigsaw to achieve this. Legislation's critical. We know that legislation is important. It's important around clarity for the law and certainly with, I'll speak about that later, about social work kind of engagement and service provision, but legislation is one part of it. And actually having legislation and having parliamentarians having this debate allows us to have a national conversation around it, which is needed. And actually it's brave. It, it's great that you're doing this because it's actually been an issue that's been around for a, a long time and it's been, it's been ducked. You know, we've not been bold enough to have the conversation. And what we find is that people have all kinds of different opinions and they hold them very strongly and they hold them very personally and they want to fight for their positions, which is fine. That's a democracy and that's what we live in. So we have that, we have that debate. I feel that legislation is also shown as being one of the, we would talk about for achieving culture change, it's one of the enablers. It's one of the things that allows change to happen, but in itself, it it can achieve relatively little. I'm so sorry to say that at Parliament, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it, what it needs is all the other factors around it, and that comes with um, your policy guidance, coaching, um, support, um, support services around it. So in itself, it can achieve some things, but what it's allowing is for us to have this national conversation, and that's a great thing, and that will allow us to progress. I think Alec Cole Hamilton has a quick supplementary on this. I'll just let him come and, in. And you can answer both questions um, when I finish, Claire. <laughs> so, um, I mean, Dr Hill, you're absolutely right. We, this parliament has ducked this issue several times previously. In fact, the last time any legislation was passed in this area was in 2003, as I mentioned in the previous panel, and that outlawed the use of headshots, implements and shaking, and that was it. Um, do you think that was enough? And did it make any kind of difference? I think 
no, I do not think it was enough. Um, but I think it was a, a reflection of change happens within the political climate and within the society and where we're at at the time. And, and sometimes we need to take smaller steps. And we've got people here demonstrated today on the whole continuum of beliefs and values that we have around this. So we make progress and we, we take small steps. I think that this bill is a really important opportunity to actually turn the kind of some of the policy rhetoric that we have around children's rights and make it real for children. It actually is a very tangible way that this Scottish Parliament can show how we, we value our children and young people. It's a very powerful message. So answering the two questions, very short answer to your question, Gail, is that actually, yes, of course, we've got to have, to have education. But legislation too. I don't see that the two are mutually exclusive. And what Professor <coughs> Heelman said earlier on about in various countries, legislation has led the way to that change and made that education possible and change possible. And in terms of Alex's question, no, I don't think it was enough. And what do I think it achieved or what did it do? I think it created confusion. Mm -hmm. It created confusion for families. We did a poll which um, I can send to you, send you the yes. data table. It's a little bit old now, but given that nobody else has done it, it's the most recent evidence we've got. And we looked at, we asked parents, what do you think the law is? Do you think assault is, you know, do you think it's illegal? We asked them, is it illegal to hit around the head? Is it legal to use an implement and so on? A hugely confused response. Um, and I don't think that's helpful for how we live our lives and how parents feel able to negotiate the law. We need clarity. Anyone else can bring you? Thanks, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, it isn't just opinion polls, and I know there's been some jive about opinion polls, but it isn't just opinion polls that the public are, are, are communicating to us about this with. There was over 400 written submissions to the committee, and the majority of the individual responses received didn't support the bill. And then just having heard Claire speak about the implementation group as well, where police will still have the... They would still have the basically using just reasonable chastisement as a case not to progress the, the smacking or if it was at the heat of the moment or something. I'm just wondering whether if we take that away, then the police won't be able to do that. They would need to progress the complaint if we take away the reasonable chastisement bit. Um, and also, do you consider that if we were to put more resource in to the information and education of how parenting would actually be more of a way to ch change the culture of society in order for us to actually change public opinion and change people's perception? Um, I suppose on organisations versus, you know, um, organisational responses versus individual responses, it's quite a difficult one because you don't know where the individuals are coming from or whatever. But at the same time, I would go back to what I said previously, that I think there is quite a lot of misunderstanding, both about the law as it stands and this law as it is proposed. I think there's a great fear of criminalisation. And I think a lot, I haven't read all of the individual responses, but I've certainly had a look through them. A lot of them refer to that criminalisation of parents. As I said before, that hasn't gone up in other countries. The other countries have not been awash with prosecutions of parents and criminalisation of parents, given that, given that that's not... I think we need to assure parents that that's not going to happen, and I think that's part of the public... In, um, part of the concerns that existed. Mm -hmm. I think it's part of a democracy, isn't it? And people have lots and lots of different views and take the opportunity to share them. And I think that, for me, the message around that is to, to listen to that whole range of views and actually listen to what are people really saying? What, what actually is their anxiety under that? Where does that come from? And is it, for some parents, um, the position that they go, I don't know what to do. I don't know. If I can't smack, I just don't know what to do. And particularly, like I have 
real concerns around and it comes into the kind of family support side and probably another debate that we can have around supporting parents with learning disabilities and them having support at all stages to to know what different strategies they can use but to be supported alongside so that they that they and many other kind of parents feel in a place where um smacking isn't the only option that they know or the only option that they feel that they have so I think for me it's always kind of just trying to go deeper into that and understand what it's about for, for others it will be a political opinion it will be a state that this is the state interfering in private family life and that's always a huge a huge tension that we have in in the world of child welfare as in the role of the state the private family life and the rub of way mm -hmm. where we come up together and that's that's particularly in our work around um, protecting children, that there's always, there's always decision-making involved. We say there's not one person that makes mm -hmm. a decision about either pursuing a, a criminal case in a very, very small number of cases that would be um, for children that experience abuse and neglect or going down other measures. But that's a kind of a multi-agency decision of which police would be part of those conversations. So I think it's kind of a little starker sometimes the way it's presented them than what it is and certainly within within that world it is about um collaborative kind of decision making but principally it is about looking at the strengths of families and working with that in a way that says what well, where are you at what what level of pressure have you got on you what 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 else is going on so that as a result of those things it means that perhaps your parenting is not as good as it can be how can we help you to be a better parent, you know, that, that's uh -huh. kind of the things where it comes to. And that, that's, sorry. sorry. Sorry if you don't mind, it's just, this is really live and real for me right now. Um, I'm 23, I've just had my first baby, as you've probably just yes. heard him <laughs> screaming there. Um, but it, he's 23 weeks old on Monday, and one of my fears um, was, it, and it still really is a, a big fear of mine, is that the state intervened in my life. Mm -hmm. The state deemed that for whatever reason, my mum wasn't fit enough to, to parent me um, due to the abuse that I was suffering in my family private life. And for me, I didn't want that to be an issue, and I'm determined not to allow that to be an issue for my son in our life. And I, there isn't a parenting book out there that I haven't read because of that, because I'm determined not to allow that to happen. But it then means that, we, where do we then say, because at the end of the day, it's all learned behaviour. What we are subjected to and what we're conditioned is it's learned repeated behaviour. And we're not allowing children and young people to be able to self-regulate when we're hitting them, when we're restraining them, when we're assaulting them. That isn't allowing people to develop. It's not allowing children to develop into society, to be good members of society, because we're just forcing them, we're pinning them down, and we're sitting on top of them and not allowing them to feel what they're feeling and allowing them to then make sense of what those feelings and what those emotions are. And I think that's why we now just make it clear that it's not okay for these types of things, rather than having a gray area of what's okay, what's not okay, abolish it. There's no place in a modern Scotland for smacking kids or for a restraint at all. And we need to make that clear. It's fundamental that we do. She just wants to come in briefly. <laughs> thank, thank you very much for, for the response. Just another quick question, and it's, the, 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 name, the name of the bill as it stands just now. I had visited a church in Glasgow with Mary Fee on Monday, and they were concerned about the name of the bill because under common law, um, an attack upon one person by another is an assault, whether it happens to an adult or child. So there is already provision there in law for assault on children. So I don't know whether the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill makes it sound as if there's no protection for children from assault just now. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the name of the bill. Can I ask that question? I, yeah. I suppose it's just that it's removing a defence rather than doing that bit. Of, yeah, I, I, it's just, I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. interested to hear the thoughts of, of the panel on it because it was something that came up to me. Isn't it? Quite often, quite often laws are incomprehensible to the public. I'm mm -hmm. not sure that that is it's necessarily yeah. a good thing. And mm -hmm. I'm to place it as the intent of the bill. And the intent of the bill is to provide equal protection for children and, and adults, as you know, and to remove that. So as you say, there is currently a ground of assault, be it mm -hmm. for adults, be it for children. And I suppose the difference is mm -hmm. that if 
I were to assault my child, there is a defence where there is no defence right. for... That, that, and, yeah. you know, that's in, mm. indefensible. Anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just we're, we're, we're drawing to an end and we have... Um, uh, I was going to call you a visiting MSP there, um, Gordon. Um, if, if you have a quick question you wish yes, to um, ask. Yes, thank you, convener. Um, just two quick quick questions. One is, Professor Jane Callaghan said that if the result of this is it results in uh, more uh, parents um, having to pay, pay a fine or going to prison, then that's not a, a positive outcome of this bill. Do you, do you agree? Do the panel agree with that? Which, what, what she said about that? Yes, I suppose I do. I mean, I think obviously where there is severe abuse, severe assault, be that of a child or an adult, then obviously mm. there is a case for going to court. I, given that this hasn't happened in other countries, there hasn't been an increase, I think there has been more of an increase in that diversionary work and that sort of ability to offer support to families with alternative parenting strategies. Mm. I would not see it as beneficial for this bill to be sending parents to prison, but nor do I anticipate that as a consequence of this bill. Well, I, I wanted to come on to that point, particularly, I think, from your evidence and Dr Hill's, um, because the, the point is what the bill does is, I mean, it's not just a technicality, I think, with respect to Fulton McGregor, although I do take uh, on board what he said. It, this is actually very serious, the way the bill is framed for people that go into court or parents that might find the police knocking at their door. Uh, I wouldn't say the current situation, the current situation, if it can be described as Victorian, what this bill does is takes us backwards. It's medieval. And the reason for that is because it falls back on the common law. Now, New Zealand, Sweden, Germany, none of these countries ever dealt with this by the common law. They brought in in terms of clearly defined, and we don't have time to look at the detail of the New Zealand Act of Parliament, clearly defined, and I think you've commented about the need for the law to be clear. So I'm just wondering if you also agree with the Equalities and Human Rights Committee evidence here today that actually this needs to be looked at in terms of what the bill actually says if we put to one side the questions about whether or not the state should decide if parents smack or not. I mean, do you agree with that evidence from the Equalities and Human Rights Committee today? Do you mean, do I agree that there should be clarity? No. So you don't you, believe there should no, be clarity? No, sorry. I said, did you mean, did I agree that it should be clear? No, I think I've missed your point. No, sorry, perhaps I've made it too confused in my attempt to shorten it. I mean, basically, put to one side the arguments about the, you know, the rights or wrongs of smacking and say, here's the bill, and these are the intentions in accordance with what you're doing. Do you agree that we need to look very carefully at what the bill provides in law, particularly whereas here it doesn't relate in any way to what has been done in other countries? I'm not entirely clear on the legal processes, mm -hmm. so I'll make that absolutely clear and I'm here to talk about parenting yes. interests. And so I would say that, you know, when sort of um, Annie Wells, for example, talked about the responsibilities of a parliamentary democracy and of what MSPs are elected to do. So I'm afraid I would hand that back to you and say that it's the responsibility <laughs> well. of this committee, and I suppose you're asking me mm. that. I don't have the expertise, but I'm sure you'll be mm. calling mm. other witnesses yeah. who will look at that. Yeah. Yeah. That would be my opinion as well, that through the due process of this, this level of parliamentary scrutiny, that those questions should yes. be answered from legal experts. Mm. So I'm not sure that we're yes. the right panel for that, sorry. And as the convener, I would say that that's exactly what the Equalities and Human Rights Committee will do through questioning our experts, so thank you. Um, John Finney, MSP, is also with us. Um, do you wish to ask no any questions? No questions, thank you, convener. OK, in which case, can I thank you all very much um, for coming this morning and, and sharing your experience and evidence with us, and we draw the session to a close.